Tonight on Beyond the Darklands, we look into the mind of Arthur Nettie Smith, one of Australia's most infamous criminals. I'm not guilty. I've never stabbed anyone. I've got no further comment on the advice of my lawyers. He's just a rapist, armed robber, heroin selling maggot. Nettie Smith ruled Sydney's violent underworld for 20 years, robbing, killing, and trafficking heroin. I despise him. Uh, I, I, I think he's one of the lowest uh, human beings I've ever come across. Corrupt police buried evidence of Smith's brutal crimes, but he double-crossed them. He used to always say to me, it'll be all right, it'll be all right, but this time it just wasn't. Tonight, clinical psychologist Dr Leah Gerritano discovers, of all the paths he could have chosen, why Nettie Smith journeyed beyond the Darklands. Nettie Smith's life story is extraordinary, and that's because he's no everyday criminal. Like many successful businessmen, he used charm, manipulation, and fearless determination to get ahead in life. But Nettie's upbringing left him with fatal flaws, anger, arrogance, impulsivity, and an insatiable desire for more. Too much was never enough for Nettie. Join me as we take a look at the makings of one of Australia's most infamous criminals. Right from the start, Arthur Stanley Smith's life was full of tragedy and misadventure. His mother, 19-year-old Elsie Smith, was already a married woman when she met an American sailor and became pregnant with Nettie. Ned always says that he was a war baby, um, that his mum, um, it was just a fling when the American sailors come out in 1944 for World War II, I think it was. Um, found out she was pregnant and then realised it too late. Despite her affair with the sailor, Elsie's marriage to Edwin Smith survived. Her son was born in Sydney on November 27th, 1944. Elsie named him Arthur Stanley and nicknamed him Nettie Noodles after the Mother Goose nursery rhyme. Elsie had three other children but was not the most capable of mothers. She was more a, a party girl. Mm, yeah, Liked she to was. party and whatnot and didn't want someone that was going to hold her back. Well, she was always going out on the drink uh, and leaving him with his grandmother. Nettie and his three siblings lived mostly with their grandmother, a fearsome woman who despised her bastard grandson. She didn't like him and he didn't like her. You know, I think actually he says he hated her. She was rather cruel to him. Yeah. Did horrible things like locking him out and locking him up. She tried to discipline him and to a point where he said he'd had enough beatings and he hit her back and beat her back. At Nettie's grandmother's house, violence was power and fighting back became a matter of survival. Ned's brother, uh, Edwin, according to Ned in the book, um, used to bash him quite consistently and with his grandmother's support. I think Ned acknowledges that that use of violence taught him that violence can get you what you want. One day, Ned grabbed a knife and stabbed his brother through the hand. The grandmother went to the police and uh, they took him away. He didn't have a mum, he didn't have a dad, um, and he's just been arrested and, and taken away to a boys' home, Mittagong. You know, at the age of 11, it's, it's, I think it's disgraceful. Without a safe person to attach to as a very young child, it's extremely hard for Nettie to become attached to anyone else. Rejection in childhood can lead to substance abuse, personality disorders, depression and anxiety. And when a child like Nettie is also subjected to violence, he's more than twice as likely to grow up violent and antisocial. After stabbing his brother Edwin, the authorities took him away. In 1956, they sent him to the sprawling Mittagong boys home two hours from Sydney. My parents were housemaster and matron of, of a home that was referred to as number 10. At the time that, that Nettie was there, number 10 was a big old comfortable home. But for me, it was still an institution. It was time to get up, time to have a shower, time to eat, time to go to school. 
There were hundreds of rebellious boys like Nettie at Mittagong, and life was regimented. But Nettie was lucky. Here the rules were clear, and he had a place. But best of all, his carers were kind to him. It wasn't an easy lifestyle. Dad was very stern um, and strict, but he was very affectionate with the boys. He'd, he'd um, rub the tops of their heads and things like that, just to show affection that way. Mum's way of showing affection would be do some cooking for them. She'd go in and make big slabs of cakes and, um, and toffees and things like that. After his family's neglect, the nurturing he experienced at Mittagong had a calming influence on Nettie. Keith Kelly, who was also there, remembers him as a happy boy. And Nettie was a quiet type of person, not standoverish or anything of that nature. Uh, loved his sport, loved to win, like most of us. If we played sport, we all liked to win. And uh, I found Nettie a very gentle and kind person. For the first time in his life, Nettie felt safe. He was being cared for properly, and in turn, he was caring for others. When I was 12 years of age, we were having visitors. Nettie came up to me and said, Keith, your hair's in a mess, let me fix your hair up. He fixed me hair up, he said, always look smart, look good, be kind to your people, look after them. I said, thanks, Nettie. I'm aware that um, Nettie said that his stay in Mittagong was one where he felt safe and he experienced warmth and that he was sorry to leave there. Nettie was 12 when he was discharged from Mittagong. His only option was to return to the misery of his dysfunctional family in Sydney. There, he was as unwanted as ever. Child needs nurturing and guidance and love and affection, and he obviously got none of those, absolutely none. Back at the bottom of his grandmother's pecking order, it wasn't long before Nettie fled and began life on his own. He had nowhere to go, so I think he was just roaming the streets, or um, at 12 years old, he, he says he was living with a prostitute, you know, so he, he would have got himself into a lot of trouble. Nettie was a young thief, and police knew him well. After four years on the street, he'd set himself up as a pimp. His criminal apprenticeship was underway, and the sex industry brought fast cash. As a 16-year-old, he was looking after a 27-year-old prostitute until he was charged by police and sent to another boy's home. This time, Nettie's punishment was ruthless. He was sentenced to the most feared of children's institutions, an old jail in the country town of Tamworth run by hardened prison officers, some of whom were accused of being brutal. Nettie and I both ended up going to Tamworth Boys Home. Uh, Tamworth was known as the mini Alcatraz of Australia for boys. It was a brutal place. The officers up there were complete bastards. They belted you, they threw you in solitary confinement, they starved you, they give you torture. If they, if they looked at each other, they, they'd be bounced, but they said bounced. Um, they wouldn't be able to have anything to eat. And they'd be put in solitary confinement. After nine months, Nettie was released from Tamworth, but his happy disposition had been beaten out of him. The change in Nettie from the time I sent him at Mittigong to the time I sent him come back from Tamworth, it'd be like having a kitten at Mittigong and having a bull terrier at Tamworth. It was just unbelievable. He had changed completely. In Tamworth Boys Home, Nettie learns that the only person in the world he can rely upon is himself, and he used aggression and dominance to survive. Any chance Nettie had of undoing his damaging childhood is gone. He's hardened and focused. He's going to get power and money the fastest way possible. And by now, he also wants one other thing, to get his own back. Nettie Smith is simmering with rage and ambition. His repeated criminal acts, his impulsivity, and his lack of concern for others means he has antisocial personality disorder and he's destined for a life of violence and crime. Now 18, 
Nettie Smith had been in and out of reform homes for seven years, and his template was set. He was a cunning young thief and a bruising street fighter. Smith was preparing to graduate to big time crime and would soon commit a brutal gang rape. By the end of his childhood, Nettie Smith had spent nearly half his life in reform institutions for boys. At 18, he was committing burglaries and getting caught. He was sent to Long Bay Jail for four years. Here, he met his future partners in crime and prepared for life as a career criminal. A career criminal is someone who will make crime his living. Inside, you learn how to break open safes, how to steal cars, how to sell drugs, all that type of stuff. And uh, you put your trust in the other people around you. In 1967, Smith was out of jail and putting to good use the skills he'd learnt inside. He began operating in Sydney's inner suburbs as a thief and violent standover man. When a young single mother was brutally raped in Petersham, it was Smith and his gang who were tagged by police. Uh, one of the first jobs that I had as a young detective or an up-and-coming detective was uh, an allegation involving a very serious rape made by a young lady and uh, involved uh, Arthur Stanley Smith, also known as Nettie Smith. It was a terrifying scene. Two of Smith's accomplices knew the victim. When she let them into her home, the men threatened to harm her baby, and then they each raped her in turn. The crime was one that uh, I'll never forget. The female victim's baby being uh, held up by its ankles in the bassinet. Three of the offenders, uh, or four of the offenders rather, raped her. One raped her twice. Just nothing more than animals. In a police lineup, the young mother bravely identified her rapist. Furious, Nettie Smith retaliated by spitting in her face. After the allegation uh, was put to, to Smith, he said, yes, the filthy bitch, I didn't rape her, it was a fair fuck. I admired the, the victim for her strength in uh, not only coming to the police, but uh, for what she did over many, many court hearings. She continued with her story and it was believed. Smith was convicted and justly so. The pack rape of this woman while threatening her infant is one of the most despicable acts imaginable. It's common for gang rapists to spread the blame between themselves. This lessens their feelings of guilt. But Smith blames the victim. He considers her beneath him and in his world, what he did to her was fair. He completely dehumanized this woman. Her suffering means nothing to him. This episode indicates that Nettie Smith is capable of completely disconnecting any empathy for another human being. For his part in the pack rape, Nettie Smith was sentenced to 12 years back in Long Bay Jail. By now, his growing reputation as a thug made him a powerful prisoner, feared by others inside. Jail society's uh, ruled by intimidation and violence. That's how it runs. I know I've spoken to to numerous prison officers that have been in jails where he's been in through the 70s and they said he ran the jail in the years he was in there amongst all the other crooks just because of his violent disposition and because of his size. Now in his early 20s, Nettie Smith was a huge man, standing nearly two metres tall and weighing 100 kilograms. Few jailers could manage him and he was moved constantly between prisons until some salient advice changed his behaviour. Ned had been a very angry man, very violent man, when the governor of Parramatta said to him that he had to take control of his life and think about what he wanted to do. And Ned reflected on that and decided that you could get more with a smile than you could with a snarl. He used to, in fact, uh, do favours for prison officers, supply them with, with information on internal happenings and that style of thing. Nettie Smith understands jail. It's a system with rules, and he knows how to play this game. But Nettie always plays by the unwritten rules in a system. The real laws of society mean nothing to him. He goes around, or he smashes straight through any obstacle to get what he wants. 
he's learned that pretty much anything can be bought, either with money, blackmail, favours or information. And when that doesn't work, there's always brute force. In 1975, 30-year-old Nettie Smith was free again after seven years in jail. He caught the eye of a girl just over half his age, 17-year-old Deborah Bell. I didn't know any of, any of Ned's background then when I first met Ned. Um, I knew that he'd only just been released from jail by a couple of months, but I just didn't really ask why. Um, but I honestly don't know what attracted, attracted me to him. He'll tell you his muscly body <laughs> and, his, and his beautiful blue eyes. Ned had a way with women. He was a good style of a bloke, good looking bloke. If there were flowers around, he'd buy them. Very charming, very charming. You could put Ned down to be good company anywhere. Good company. He was good, he, he always had a joke to tell. He was quick-witted. Really, he, he was quite a charming person. You can get on the bad side of Ned, but there is a side that he's that a gentleman and, and gentle and soft and whatever. How can Nettie Smith be capable of such a brutal rape against one woman and yet be able to use manners and decorum to win Deborah? Well, there are two points to consider here. The first is that Nettie wants to belong. He wants to create the family he never had with a wife and children. And Nettie's not a psychopath. Despite his capacity for acts of extreme violence, he is also capable of forming meaningful, lasting relationships with certain people. Less than a year after getting out of prison, Nettie and Deborah set up house together in Alexandria to start a family. For the sake of their relationship, clean living Deborah tried to turn a blind eye to Nettie's budding criminal empire. He used to always say to me, the less you know, the better. In a way, I'm glad, no, I didn't know to the extent what he was doing. No, I'm glad I didn't. He quickly became involved in debt collecting, SP bookmaking, and then found the big money maker, heroin trafficking. By the mid 1970s, there was a cancerous culture of corruption within a core group of the New South Wales Police Force. And Smith positioned himself to take full advantage and propel his criminal career. In his early 30s, Nettie Smith was an established standover man, armed robber, and heroin dealer. He'd already served two lengthy jail terms and he was arrested again in 1976 after a violent hold-up. It was Smith's 32nd birthday, and he was in luck. His arresting officer was Detective Roger Rogerson. The first day I met Ned was at uh, Rockdale Police Station. Um, Ned was um, a suspect for an attempted armed robbery on Fielders Bakery. That late November day would prove to be the start of a long relationship between the criminal and the detective. I could see potential in Ned as an informer. He wanted to be friendly. He wanted to... Uh, he, he wanted to get close. And this is how police officers, especially detectives in my day, were successful. But Rogerson and Smith were more than just detective and informant. Went out many a times for dinners and lunches. I'd met his kids come to our home. I can tell you there was times where I dropped and I know it was money. Ned just used to wrap it up and used to say, can you take this over and meet Roger at so-and-so or this one at so-and-so? And I did. And I'd give it to him. I know it was going on. It was going on. I mean, why else would you pay police? Nettie Smith was working hand in glove with some corrupt police, paying them off and being protected. He swiftly established himself as a heroin king. By 1978, he was the biggest heroin dealer in Australia and part of a brazen multi-million dollar drug syndicate operating between Bangkok and Sydney. These blokes would walk straight back in through customs with a suitcase full of heroin and no one had any idea. They were completely under the radar back in those days. Well, before you knew it, they had two or three suitcases full of heroin. Which, he, which he'd sold, well, suddenly he's rolling in money. Every six weeks, it's believed Nettie Smith received about 15 kilos of imported heroin, which he'd deal for well over a million dollars. 
He never used the drug himself, but Smith was addicted to the money heroin made him. He cruised the night spots of Sydney like a Hollywood gangster, occasionally accompanied by Deborah. I remember Hazy Lands one time. It was a scary place because I was really never a nightclub person anyway. I don't drink. When we got out of the car before we actually went in there, I looked and I thought, that looks like a Tommy Hawk sort of thing. And he put it under his jacket and I didn't think anything of it. We were only there about 20 minutes. Must have been, I don't even know if it was that. And just all hell broke loose, you know, there was... There wasn't just Ned's axe that come out from his jacket, but there was axes that come out from behind the bar and everything. It was just incredible. Um, and I just stood there and screamed. I just didn't know what to do. I was horrified, absolutely horrified. The fast money was intoxicating, and Smith loved living the high life. He had made it and wanted everyone in Sydney to know. I think perhaps it was, I've, I've survived and look where I've got to. Yeah. Uh, look at me. The boy from the slums. Ned enjoyed everything about being a criminal. Uh, fast cars, fast women, and just the lifestyle generally. They, they give themselves away, these blokes. They've, they've got to have flash cars. They've got to have plenty of bling and this sort of stuff. I was in uh, on Parramatta Road there, and I saw this nice, shiny, green Rolls Royce go by, and there was a toot in the horn, and sure enough, it was Ned. He was an immaculate dress. He was. He had a belt buckle made, actually, with diamonds in it. I remember when he bought it home, he said to me, <laughs> Elvis Presley wouldn't even have one of these. <laughs> Nettie's drive for the high life and fast money has its origins in early childhood deprivation and low self-esteem. As a child, he was made to feel as though he was nothing, and he wants to prove all those people wrong. His motto is, if it feels good, do it. But these pleasures are self-defeating. In the end, he feels empty and alone, and so the cycle begins again. Nettie's addicted to, but ultimately unsatisfied by this lifestyle, and yet he cannot imagine living any other way. In October 1978, a police raid in Thailand brought Nettie Smith's narcotics operation crashing to a halt. Bangkok police arrested Sydney rugby league star Paul Haywood and two other associates with eight and a half kilograms of heroin bound for Australia. It wasn't long before federal police arrested Smith in Sydney. Ned looked to be facing a very, very long jail sentence, except that some heroin that had been seized became contaminated somehow. And when it came to court, the forensic evidence didn't stand up and the charges were thrown out. That cost a bit of money to the right people. Smith escaped a lengthy prison term and he was sentenced to just two and a half years in jail. But he and Deborah now had a three-year-old daughter, and from behind bars, Nettie asked for Deborah's commitment. Yeah, he disappointed me a lot, actually, but I loved Ned that much that he, he asked me to marry him and I just wanted to marry him. So I did. The remand centre at Long Bay Jail doubled as a chapel for Deborah and Nettie's wedding on the 2nd of February, 1980. No, I didn't hate the fact of marrying Ned, but I did hate getting married in jail because I always pictured myself as walking down the aisle and being a bride. I mean, I could have wore a bride's dress, I suppose, but it would have looked a bit funny, eh? So, yeah. It looked lovely anyway. Yeah. We got married and they had a bit of finger food and 10 minutes later we were at the door. By Christmas 1980, Smith was free from jail. Straight away, he started preparing a full-scale relaunch of his criminal career as standover man, SP bookmaker and drug dealer. It would never have crossed Ned's mind uh, to go straight. Uh, Ned, well, I just could not imagine Ned ever working in any job. He's not that sort of person. Um, a nine-to-five job, he just would never have done it. Smith brazenly re-established himself as a drug lord with ten dealers under him. One of them was young King's Cross criminal Warren Lanfranchi. In 1981, Lanfranchi was a wanted man after a bungled armed robbery. Roger Rogerson asked Nettie Smith to bring Lanfranchi to a meeting, but events that winter's day in Dangar Place went dramatically wrong. Lanfranchi walked over and then he's, then he's reached in front of his dutch and he's 
pulling out this this pistol. You don't wait any longer when you see that happening. So I fired two shots. Once, one shot, and then there was a slight delay because he was still very animated and moving. So I fired again. And uh, down he went, dead. In the drama that unfolded after the shooting, Smith supported Roger Rogerson. His reward would be protection, which effectively gave him a green light to commit violent and profitable crimes. By the 1980s, Sydney's underworld was the Wild West, fast, violent and profitable. And Nettie Smith was on top of the game. But trouble was brewing. In 1981, an inquest began into Warren Lanfranchi's death. Detective Sergeant Rogerson had told the inquest he shot Lanfranchi twice in self-defence. Then, Lanfranchi's partner, Sally Ann Huckstep, dropped a bombshell. The high-profile prostitute, police informer and heroin addict claimed her boyfriend's death was a setup. She was adamant that he had left home with $10,000 in cash stuck down the front of his pants in $20 notes. Huckstep's version of events was attracting a lot of media attention. At the coroner's inquest, the police involved needed the support of Nettie Smith. Nettie didn't let them down and Roger Rogerson was officially cleared of wrongdoing in Lanfranchi's death. Do you think that what they've said will be the end of it? Oh, definitely not. This is only the first round. Police were very happy with the evidence that Nettie gave to the coroner over the Lanfranchi affair. And these certain police gave Ned the green light. The green light was that Ned could virtually do any robbery that he wanted to do. Um, and have the police protection there because he was paying them to be able to do it. Um, and he got away with it for a long time. The amount of money Ned was seeing, he, he didn't know what to do with it all. He was hiding it at friends' houses. He was putting it in vaults and couldn't put it in the bank because it would draw attention, but he couldn't spend it as quickly as it was coming in. With his business booming in Sydney in the 1980s, Nettie and Deborah moved to a quiet suburb of Newcastle to raise their children. He's always been a fantastic father. He adores his kids. Um, and he would he would die for him. Die for him. I Ned looked after his family. I, I don't I don't know of any situation where he didn't look after his kids. He he always loved his kids and saw a fair bit of them as much once as he could see of them. Gave them whatever they wanted. But Nettie Smith was living an incongruous double life. Every week, he'd spend from Thursday to Sunday in Sydney working his criminal operation. Then, he'd retreat home to Newcastle to play the family man. It was just like being married to a doctor, you know? You're married to a bank robber, and, and I know it sounds silly, but basically that's what it is. He kept another lady uh, in a unit at Redfern. Um, she was like his Sydney wife, I think it's been referred to in the papers, and his Newcastle wife was in Newcastle. He's very lazy. He used to just like to lay around. Sometimes by the time Thursday came, I used to think, oh, God, he'd be <laughs> go, going to Sydney. That's the life he wanted to lead. Do Dr. In Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. Well, maybe we all have two sides. I'm on three or four sides. We didn't really have much in common at all. I mean, really, I was the mother of his of his kids, um, and he knew that I was always at home with the kids, and he had a home to come home to. So maybe it might have been security for him. What is it about violent antisocial men that attracts women? Well, it's usually a combination of the background and personalities of each. Men like Nettie are able to charm and talk their way out of or into almost anything and their confidence, assertiveness and control can be very attractive to some women. Men like Nettie will intrude into your body space when speaking and maintain intensive eye contact to mesmerise you. And on top of that, they're great liars. I, I was never ever ashamed of what Ned did because I feel in my heart he didn't really hurt anybody. He wasn't hurting anybody by doing it. He didn't know I'm Robbie. There was never anybody hurt in there, like hurt in, in the crossfire or anything like that. I know it was the wrong thing to do, but there was never any casualties. 
The shooting happened just before 7 o'clock in the midst of late night shoppers. Life as a drug dealer in 1980s Sydney was territorial and tenuous. There were mysterious and horrible deaths, and Smith was in the thick of it. I've said many times that the heroin turned penny criminals into monsters. Where they have all this money, they can offer $150,000 to get someone killed. Uh, and, and, does, and they don't blink an eye. In the mid-1980s, Sydney had a gangland war over heroin dealing, and Nettie Smith was pretty closely tied with a series of people who were involved in that, and the victims, Danny Chubb, Tony Eustace, Chris Flannery. He knew these people well, he dealt with them in business, and mostly the heroin business and the gun business, and he drank with them socially, and even went on holidays with Chris Flannery at one point. Nettie Smith seemed invincible, doing his criminal deals out in the open in the public bars and clubs of Sydney. He was an unbelievable drinker. He could, he could outdrink me, and I'm not too bad. 20 or 30 in a day, maybe more. Well, I used to tell people that other blokes would train in the gym, never would train on beer. I used to be the one who used to have to go and pick him up because he was too drunk to drive home. Yeah, I was scared at times. You know, it's uh, not that he was ever, he was never really violent towards me. Um, but um, we'd have, we'd have really some bad arguments sometimes and I used to think, well, you know, I better pull up. I'm going a bit too far. Nettie Smith's drinking was masking his declining health. He'd been diagnosed with the neurological illness, Parkinson's disease, and it was starting to take hold of him. Ned was diagnosed in 1981. Um, I think he was only 36, 35, 36 when he was diagnosed, which was quite young, actually. He had the tremor down his right side, which was his right arm and right leg. He used to get the shakes. Um, it was quite noticeable, and he was on some sort of medication. He'd take a few pills, and that'd settle him down. But, I mean, he's had Parkinson's disease for years and years and years. But Nettie's woes were just beginning. The drama surrounding Warren Lanfranchi's shooting wouldn't die. In 1986, five years after her boyfriend's death, a still grieving Sally Ann Huckstep went on television and cried foul play. Just weeks later, she was found dead. A post-mortem is underway tonight after the death of a Sydney prostitute. The body of Sally Ann Huxton was fished out of a pond at Centennial Park today. Soon, Nettie Smith would be accused of Sally Ann Huckstep's murder. It was the beginning of the end for the crime boss. Nettie Smith had established a multi-million dollar criminal empire in Sydney with the help of corrupt police. But in 1986, it was all in jeopardy. Smith's main contact in the New South Wales Police Force, Detective Roger Rogerson, was stripped of his badge for misconduct. Should you be calling any of your criminal contacts at that all? Will be, that, that is in the hands of my legal advisor at this stage. With Rogerson gone, Smith's police protection evaporated, but he recklessly carried on. With every criminal, they get greedy. They do get greedy. Enough is not enough. We had enough money to set us up for, for our life and our kids' lives and our grandkids' lives. Smith was now operating on a knife edge without protection, committing armed robberies around Sydney worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. He was drinking heavily and his behaviour was increasingly violent and erratic. Things slowly started to spin slightly out of control. Ned acknowledges that there was an insanity about his drinking and he knew that something would go wrong that would pull him up in the end. On the 30th of October, 1987, he snapped. In regard to Ned's murders, um, well, of course, there were others that Ned would have committed prior to Flavel. Flavel was the, maybe the unnecessary one. After an all-day drinking session, Nettie Smith encountered a tow truck driver who challenged him in the traffic. A fight broke out and Smith lost control. He stabbed the truck driver to death in a fit of rage. 
during the fight, 34-year-old Ronnie Flavel was stabbed. He staggered across the road to a shop before he collapsed and died. Smith says he will defend the charge. I'm not guilty. I never stabbed anyone. I've got no further comment on the advice of me lawyers. I, I, think, it's, I think it's fair to say that uh, alcohol accelerated his aggression. Um, but, to, but to stupid levels, you know, like fancy stabbing a man to death over a, 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 a traffic dispute. Nettie's world is unravelling. Because he's lost his protection, it's almost as though he's been transported back to his grandmother's house, a world of chaos where there are no rules, he doesn't belong and nothing makes sense. Nettie's abusing alcohol to try to maintain some sense of control, but it has devastating consequences. By Christmas 1988, Nettie Smith was facing a murder charge. But he carried on, recklessly planning a major armed robbery of Botany Council. Well, they're going to do that payroll at um, Botany Council just to get some money for Christmas for the kids. And uh, it was $200,000. The kids must get expensive presents, perhaps. But police were tracking his every move. On the day of the heist, three days before Christmas, 30 combat troops lay in wait. They were in a stolen van, they had balaclavas, they had guns. They were certainly going to hold the place up. The door slid open and Ned and Glenn Black, who were both dressed in identical track suits and gloves, got out and we laid them on the footpath on their bellies and put their hands behind their back and handcuffed them. There was an sawn off shotgun, which ironically enough, it was at one stage registered to the New South Wales Police Department. He was shaking like a leaf. He, uh, he'd lost the dominant position and the guns were turned on him. When we're driving back to the CIB from Botany Council in the police car, uh, Ned was a bit dejected and he said, well, I'm really gone for it now, or words to that effect. He said, I wish you'd shot me. This is the end, I'll be back in jail. It was all over. Nettie Smith would soon be back in jail. The fallen crime king was humiliated and now hell-bent on revenge against police. For two decades from the 1970s, Nettie Smith ruled Sydney's violent underworld. He'd raped, murdered, masterminded bank robberies and earned millions of dollars trading heroin. He'd been aided by a few corrupt police, but his fearsome power was now all but gone. In 1989, Nettie Smith was in jail for the Botany Council hold-up and he was defending a murder charge for the road rage attack on Ronald Flavel. What, how, how confident do you feel about this? Very confident of acquittal. In 1990, he was convicted and sentenced to life in jail. Smith seized his opportunity for revenge. The Independent Commission Against Corruption was investigating the New South Wales Police Force and from jail, Smith offered to assist. It was revenge with Ned, with the ICAC, um, because uh, they'd done the wrong thing by him for the Botany Council payroll. Ned obviously thought that he had the green light and he didn't have. And it was after that that he thought, you know, hang on, why am I protecting these people for? Ned has some loyalties, distorted though they may be but when his business partners in the police service cut him loose, he wreaks havoc. Nettie won't tolerate rejection. Like a rattlesnake, he bites back. He sets his mind to deliberately and meticulously take down as many people as he can. He received a, something very unusual, and that was an indemnity from the New South Wales government for any crime, except for murder, that he admitted to. So Ned Smith started talking about armed robberies, started talking about bashing, started talking about drug dealing, started talking about a series of crimes over 15, 20 years that involved police and payments to police. In 1992, Nettie Smith made sworn accusations against 97 police officers. All Ned's allegations were just nothing more than bloody bullshit. Simple as that. But he didn't only turn on me, he turned on everybody. Police began secretly recording Nettie Smith's conversations in jail. In 1998, he was taped bragging about killing 12 people. And within a year, Smith was charged with seven more counts of murder. His most sensational confession was about the death of Sally Ann Huckstep. 
Smith was taped describing how he'd strangled her in Sydney's Centennial Park. Smith is recorded boasting, I hit her, punched her, choked her. There was terror in her eyes. I left her floating there. I believe in my heart that he's not capable of doing it. I know he's not. In November 1999, the Sally Ann Huckstep murder trial resulted in an acquittal for Nettie Smith. But it made no difference to his future. Already in jail for murder, Smith would never walk as a free man again. Ned is now facing, well, he's now doing two life sentences. He's been in jail for 20 years. He's a very sick man. He's in his almost middle 60s. He's got advanced Parkinson's disease. And the expectation is he'll never be released from jail. He has a lot of regrets, yeah. His regrets of not seeing his kids grow up, um, not seeing his grandkids grow up. He says his life's been a balls up, but at the same time, he doesn't want any sympathy and he hasn't asked for any support in that sense. Um, his belief is he's made his decisions and he has to live with them. Nettie Smith has been in institutions for 33 of his 64 years, more than half his life. It doesn't seem surprising that the little boy who grew up behind bars will die there too. I do feel sorry for Nettie. Nettie shouldn't have, should not be where he is today. Violence breeds violence. If it's a dog and you kick a dog when it's young, the dog's gonna retaliate. Nettie Smith remains in Long Bay Jail. His Parkinson's disease is crippling, but he can still type a letter, and he is very upfront about his life as he remembers it. I have not kept in touch with anyone from my childhood days. Don't know if they're all dead or alive. I've always been a learner, so haven't encouraged any friendships from my adult life. There is no one from my early life that could assist you, because there is no one. I'm sorry I can't help you any further, but that's my life and I cannot change it. For the day he dies, Ned will keep telling lies if he gets the chance. If someone's prepared to listen, Ned will tell them a great story and it'll be a lie. He's one of those icons of Australian crime, but uh, I'm just glad that he's in jail and so should everybody else that lives in this city. Unwanted as a child, Nettie Smith had nowhere to belong and he learned from his earliest years that life has a pecking order and that he was at the bottom of it. These lessons drove him in life. In his rise to the top of the criminal underworld, Smith showed enormous versatility and determination, but he truly was a product of his poisonous environment. If he'd been born into a safe family with opportunities to use his drive and intellect in positive ways, would he still have become a killer? Maybe not, but of course, we'll never know.